the media's job is to disentangle that. Mm -hmm. The media's job is to know more about the conversation than what somebody said yesterday Mm -hmm. and to be able to connect what Donald Trump is saying to a history of thought and to a history of action and to a history of consequence. I think the media's main failing in all of this is that it went for a entertainment-based narrative instead of an information-based narrative. And, And we should have been scholars. Hi, this is Frank Schaefer, and you are watching live on Facebook and or listening to the podcast version of my podcast, In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. And today, my guest is Becca McNeil. And Becca is a journalist whose work has appeared in Texas Monthly, Sojourners, The Guardian, Christianity Today, The Christian Science Monitor, among others. She has a website. We're going to link to all that so you can find Becca, check out her stuff. This is an odd interview for me because Becca interviewed me for an article she was writing about me for Sojourners, what seems like just a couple of days ago. I don't know what it really was. What was it, Becca? Week three, six, a year? Oh, no. (laughs) I think we're at about probably two months ago. Okay. Well, time is all one thing to me, so I don't know. Mm -hmm about this. You could have said yesterday and I would agree. So this feels odd because we, she was supposed to interview me for like 20 minutes or something. And I think we talked for two hours or something. So we're, we're, we're great fast friends and (laughs) I'm going to just pick up the conversation where I left off. I'm going to have to remember that people listening to this podcast weren't party to that conversation and we have to kind of begin at the beginning. So let me pretend that we didn't talk for two hours very recently and ask you uh, about yourself. You're a journalist and you you come from a background a little bit similar to mine in the sense that you have also been on a kind of journey from one form of spirituality into another, plus you've written on the subject. You're one of those people that I don't have to explain anything to in terms of my own journey that I write about in my memoir, Crazy for God. And when you interviewed me for Sojourners, I think you were asking me questions related to my journey out of the Christian right evangelical movement, pro-life movement into a a kind of a very different position. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's kind of our, that's a very bad introduction, but that's our kind of background together. So Becca, let me, let me start at the beginning with you. You're, you're um, a journalist. You're, I think you're located in Texas. Isn't that right? Yes. San Antonio. And you come from what background? Tell people who listen to this, who you are, kind of your journey um, to where you are today, snapshot, like sure for beginning, middle, and where, where are you at? Yeah. So I grew up in the PCA, the Presbyterian church in America right. and, uh, in Texas, which, you know, gives it a whole different flavor. Um, and the Christian schools, that I went to. So the, the PCA is not quite as well established in Texas as it is in like the deep South. Right. And so they don't have the schools and the whatever. So the schools that my parents sent me to were a little more uh, charismatic evangelical. Mm-hmm. And so I had that, some of that influence coming in. And then I went to, for undergraduate, I went to the master's at the time it was called the master's college. Now it's the master's university. Mm. So, and all, and I, uh, my first job between undergrad and grad school was for worldview Academy, the leadership and apologetics training camp. I, I I was so deep into it. Um, it, it really was my whole world and whole identity, Mm. I would say. And then, Actually, there was a few things that happened. Um, I mean, I went to Labrie, <laughs> which, right, which was for a, people for for people who grew up in in a in the bigger world was the ministry my parents started in Switzerland that then became an international ministry. And when were you there? I was there in, and I went to the one in uh, in the UK, okay. and I was there in two thousand five. Okay. Um, and that was as, 
as much as that is still very much in the the Christian world, hmm. um, it was actually a first little peck at um, at least thinking beyond the very, very, very rigid combative structures, because hmm. there was a lot of openness there among the staff and among the people who were there. We ended up traveling together. I went to grad school in the UK um, at the London and School. And what were you in- studying in grad school? Uh, media. Okay. So at this point you're so so you're doing something other than apologetics and all (laughs) the rest of it. And I studied creative writing in college. There was always these little, I look back and look at them now as almost like little prophets. Um Mm -hmm. people who were a safety outlet, a place to to kind of like safety valve to keep me from just completely imploding from all the pressure Hmm. um because there's a lot of pressure there's a lot of pressure theologically you can't be curious i'm curious by nature i'm i'm an inquirer adventurer curious spirit and you can't do that and so Hmm. and it's hard on creative people because Hmm. you can't push you can't challenge authority and so under all the authoritarianism there would always be these people that i would be drawn to who became my best friends, became a mentor, et cetera, who were made this all survivable for me Hmm. as my nature and nurture kind of actually struggled. Um, Found a lot of those types at Labrie, then went to the London School of Economics. And that was where things really started to change and I still came back and tried to work actually for the PCA in a like it that with for their campus ministry reformed university fellowship um that led to a short-lived and disastrous ministry career uh because by this time the the train had left the station on curiosity and questioning patriarchal authority and um when i when it finally crashed and burned i decided to use my degree (laughs) and uh much to my parents delight um and my parents it's so funny (laughs) i on the one hand they raised me into the values that say working for the church is the highest good the best thing you could do on the other hand um i think they were like well then what are we going to do what are, why are you getting all this education what are you going to do for it there's no fut- there's no like you're supposed to be submissive women can't be in the pulpit women can't be ordained but we did do, we did plan on you being either a fortune 500 ceo or the president of the united states so what's what are you doing <laughs> and so there's tons of cognitive dissonance and um th- so i was working in journalism had kid, got married, had kids. My husband is equally kind of suspicious. His, I'd say I go with curious and he's takes more of a suspicious um, eye toward the church and all of its antics. Mm-hmm. And then our kids started growing up and we had to start answering what, what do we want to give them? Like we did benefit from a lot of the, the, spirit the faith we grew up with Hmm. we did benefit from having a spiritual connection in difficult times you know the slings and arrows of growing up but we were anxious i was anxious uh he was depressed (laughs) you know Hmm. what do is this what we want to give them and so we started just asking i think it led to another phase of Okay, instead of just kind of having this loose association and skepticism, maybe a little cynicism, Mm. we actually need something connected and healthy to give our kids. And that's what led to the book. I started talking to people about their experiences doing that. Um, So my first book was that. It was a journalist and mother. Just give, give me the title. Uh, bringing up kids when church lets you down. Yeah, that was the book that I look um, knew knew about before we met that you interviewed me. Right, uh, and, and and that I forget one when that came out. That came out less than a year ago. That came out. Yeah, in so the, that's fairly new. Yes, 
Um, and it's that part memoir, part journalism. There's lots of mm -hmm. people's stories contributing to it, just of people trying to put it back together. And, and you're just seeing more and more and more of that. You're going to see more and more of that. Right. Because of the self-inflicted wounds of evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. And that's, I, I have found a, a happy landing place at Sojourners, people who think about uh, good things in the world and who aren't like, don't have a chokehold on or letting me grow and explore, you know, don't care that I'm growing and exploring and trying to figure out what my spirituality is going to look like. How do Where, I? Where's your husband on this chart right now? Just snapshot. Well, and did he come from a similar background at all? I mean, do you both come out of a churchy thing? Yeah, he was part of the bad, what we grew up thinking of as the bad Presbyterians. Bad he Presbyterians, was, yeah. He was part of the PCUSA, very country clubby, right. very social. But he um, had a really great RUF, uh, P, you know, Pres PCA campus minister in, in college who has actually turned out to be a really wonderful person and is no longer in that role. Um and and really did come to a place of like genuine faith mm -hmm. but as we hold up honestly for him the bigger like i mean he the politics are disgusting to him but he's one of those people who could very easily be like well, i'm just a progressive christian you know he'd be very happy to be in the elca like and then the, how old are your kids now seven and nine Okay. And so do they, do you take them to church? Ooh. Um, <laughs> occasionally we, we did. And when I, when I wrote the book, we, we were doing that for community mm -hmm. and to have them growing up in, we'd found a church that the message they were getting is we love you. God loves you. Mm -hmm this is a place you can come and and be loved and talk about your and bring your questions we really did find a great community um the pandemic wiped it out mm. um and there were some things about it that i was they were not affirming that mm -hmm. it was becoming a, a big problem to me um in that season and it is definitely a, a deal breaker now i want to cut to two i want to cut to two questions that i mm -hmm. want you to have a lot of time to deal with and they're a little off the chart and they're mm -hmm. a little rude. Do and it. unless I knew you and trusted you and liked you, I wouldn't dare ask this. Oh, I'm so prepared. And, and like all rude questions, they sort of reflect my own um, journey. The first is that Daniel Dennett, who's a very famous philosopher and scientist and part of what we call the four horsemen of the apocalypse of the four big new atheists, Daniel Dennett, Christopher Hitchens, um, and another, and and what's his name? Um, couple, the, the other British philosopher who was always on Bill Maher, you know, the famous atheist and so forth and so on. Mm. And D Daniel Dennett's just written a new book. He's 80 something, basically just saying, look, here's a book about how as an atheist, a real atheist, um, not on some journey towards spirituality, and he's gone from Christianity to crystals and witches, you know, none of that yeah. bullshit, just actual atheist, yeah. science-based <laughs> atheism. And he said, look, I just wanted to write a book at the end of my life saying that this has been a good life as an atheist, and I haven't mm -hmm. needed all these moral structures, and I'm a moral person without God, and I've had a good life, and I'm close to my children, and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. Ironically, by the way, <laughs> one of his kids became a pastor his daughter <laughs> so, what the hell they're gonna do that <laughs> they're gonna do that they're gonna disappoint us all um but in any case so one of my questions to you bluntly is you know why haven't you pursued that path and why don't you have the courage as it were and i'm talking to myself here as well to just bite the bullet and just say look the path on i'm on let me just cut to the finish here mm -hmm. i've spent half of my life pursuing delusion why mm -hmm. should I finish my life as a delusional fool? Why don't I just bail now and do something else? Yeah. That's for you and for me. So, sure. and I've sort of gone that way myself now um, in that direction. The other one is in looking at the people you write for, and this is the rude one, mm -hmm. not 
Texas Monthly, but Sojourners, not The Guardian, Christianity Today, Christian Science, well, they're not a, a, a yeah. thing. Have you found as a writer who writes on these subjects um, and blogs on these subjects, and if you look at your website, you have certain things, a certain hesitancy in going the Daniel Dennett route because it's like, well, shit, then I'm not going to be able to write for Sojourners anymore. And this is my shtick. This is what <laughs> yeah, I do. I'm making money. And if I her. just say I've spent my life living in a delusional, you know, science fiction fantasy. And now mm-hmm. I'm really going to be an atheist and I'm done with this and I'm done with the whole subject. Then all of mm-hmm. a sudden, does your client list get much smaller as a writer? And is that a consideration in the same way that I know pastors and their wives who would have bailed mm. years ago mm-hmm. if they could figure out a way to earn a living or people yeah. raised missionary families like me? Hey, this is all we learned how to do. Yeah. So there's sort of two questions and I want you to riff on it. A, yeah. why don't you just yeah. bite the bullet and go there? What's wrong with you that you're still messing around with all this faith bullshit? Secondly, uh, you know, is part of the hesitancy because then Sojourners won't say interview Frank Schaefer because now you're sure. really outside of the fold throwing big, heavy, nasty rocks through plate glass windows. Um, first of all, as we, I think, no, I, or in my experience, Christians are way meaner to the ones inside than they are outside. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so if I was trying to emotionally preserve myself, um, I would definitely no longer try to even claim any association. Um, yeah. So, but now, and I don't, they, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but Christianity today, I, I'm, a, I'm pretty sure I've left the fold there. Mm-hmm. Um that you know that was that was a few years ago post this post the book that i wrote i don't i think i have left orthodoxy mm-hmm. and that that's and that was a i that has been a real thing i have also started to um explore the world of psychedelics which puts you off the orthodoxy. I mean, my whole career has been a steady deep breath, take the jump. I'm I'm helped by the fact that my husband has a completely agnostic career. He's an architect and, you know, we're not and doing okay. Oh, he's doing he's doing very well and, you know, we're it, we can't be a one income household, but we aren't going to starve. Yeah. And um so that that helps me be brave. What also helps me be brave is that I I just don't like being miserable and I don't lie. So mm-hmm. there's no lies. It would be a lie at this point for me to say, I don't believe in God. This has all been a delusion. I am still, if I'm being completely honest, in a, a phase of believing in a something higher than ourselves. Mm. In believing in a spiritual realm. And I understand that that's, that's heresy to the materialist option that was given to me when, as I began to leave orthodoxy. But I will say that for my own mental health, um, the, the toll of living as though hmm. there was no, there was nothing beyond me and the chemicals in my brain causing the reaction. It was, it was harming my ability to be a parent. It was harming my ability to live in a world in chaos. And, um, I don't see it as a crutch. I see it as when I started to say, okay, let's look at what is spirituality outside the, outside the, Hmm. the bounds. Let's, let's start exploring, start reading, start going to, different religious services looking for i'm not looking for a new religion i'm not looking for something to replace what i'm lost i'm looking for what was it Hmm. what was the thing that for 28 years did serve did what was real in there Hmm. and and that i think is a different west 
And I do think that it touches science. I do think that there's, there's scientists like Lisa Miller and, um, some, some of the people getting into quantum mechanics and stuff who are starting to just go, okay, there's stuff, people exploring Johns Hopkins and their studies with psychedelics. I understand that it's, it is infuriatingly woo woo bullshit. I get it. Hmm. At the same time, it is the 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 strictly materialist atheism wasn't serving me it but wasn't you know, it what, was... Dan, what daniel dennett says um and i talked to him a couple of times when i was writing a book called patience with god which was sort of uh, when i wrote that i was kind of what you're articulating now mm -hmm. kind of where you are now um i don't want to put words in your mouth but i think if you read the book you'd say yeah that's kind of where i'm at right mm -hmm. now in, in um, not in every detail, but this sort of midpoint away from orthodoxy towards something else. But, you know, he always comes back with what I think is a very good point. And that is, I mean, crutches aside, um, that the actual universe itself is mysterious and miraculous enough, including our brains and place in it, to give him everything he needs in the area of what I would call aesthetic spirituality. This is beautiful. It's amazing. It's it's beyond understanding. It is mysterious in itself. Mm -hmm. I don't need to overlay that with a, frigid, a sort of a magical veneer, in addition to which of, you know, the, as you were saying facetiously, the sort of woo-woo element. And mm -hmm. I really understand, you know, be, I, that didn't used to be enough for me, but increasingly mm -hmm. it is. But that's not to say you know, we're not having a good discussion about where you're at. I'm just saying that's sure. sort of where I'm at on that chart if it's a chart and mm -hmm. i think daniel dennett has a really good point and that is we're so used to the idea that the kind of magical overlay is a kind of another step we need to keep mystery and purpose and meaning in life i find that parallel in the apologetics that my dad used to put forward saying you know if we can't have morality without god and the lawgiver right but of I course Evolution teaches that same morality because it teaches cooperation. So long before Jesus said anything, humans themselves, as they evolved, learned that if they don't cooperate and care for people in their midst, everybody go, everybody dies. So, you know, that it's the survival of the friendliest all the way down, always has been. Otherwise, you just don't make it as a community because it really does take a village. So I just think, I just think Dennett has a point that really people like you and me who are on a journey out of something into something else, wherever we wind up, have to deal with the fact that on an emotional level, we still have this sense of a final loyalty to an emotional magical overlay without which we feel there won't be as much meaning in our lives, but maybe we're looking through the wrong end of the telescope. I'm not saying that's a hundred percent my view, mm -hmm. but it's more my view than not. Yeah. I'm not, it may, that may be the trajectory. I also think that there is, so human beings grew into that, the satisfaction with materialism. Our ancestors are, you know, or not, they were animists, then they were, you know, mythologers. And, you know, that we have this human history of, how we make sense of things and materialism being enough is largely facilitated by all that we know hmm. through technology and through science you know these guys are not scientists by accident right and i think that to say okay we've reached the we've reached it we've we've found it there's nothing more to know now like and it's all just explore like there's nothing more to know metaphysically or and I think I'm seeing like there's people talking, spiritual innovators, whatnot, about like, what if the physical and the metaphysical aren't different? And it, mm. it's like what didn't it saying, but it's an and it's a next level of saying that I mean, people are calling it Christian animism, they're calling it theistic mm. naturalism there's some people who kind of say richard Rohr's stuff is in the panentheism is leaning toward this mm. but this idea that the natural working is the metaphysical working and that they are what we have always seen as separate are actually one 
Mm. That's intriguing to me because it is neither, oh, it's just the chemicals in my brain, nor is it a demon or a spiritual, a spiritual battle. It is the spiritual battle that is the chemicals in my brain and the mm -hmm. chemicals in my brain that are what I have always defined as spiritual. And it's not that, oh, oh, I'm mistaken. It's that they've come together in a way that is kind of saying yes to more than it's saying no. Now, my disposition is, I mean, yes, I am, we joke about this in our home, like I am the yes, my husband is the no. Mm -hmm. And in there you have order. My, I have a, a predilection to want to integrate people's truths and want to say, like, and that's, that is, that's a, that's a disposition. So I'm, but I also think that as we kind of move past our evangelical upbringing, what science and religion have in common is an idea of fact, fiction, right, wrong, you know, mm. and like ontologically, yes, something can't be and not be, but I think that there is this whole realm of, of those two things of, of fact and I think there's, I think there's room to grow is what I'm saying. I don't think that the, the Dawkins, Hitchens, you know, those guys, that, that set of guy, the four horsemen solved the mist. It's like, no, of course they figured didn't. it all out. And I don't think no. they would say that, but I'm just saying if I go, okay, where, where are we going? Cause we're still going <laughs> like mm. we haven't blown up yet. <laughs> Yeah. So that's, well, that's you know, the still my... going thing is where you and I, I think, agree. You know, I'd put it at a slightly different. I think a lot of the problem with the discussions from Chris Hitchens and the others, um, you know, as I read them and actually talked to him after he read my book, um, uh, Crazy for God, and I had some conversations with him. But the thing is, where they were similar to my father, for instance, in his apologetic approach of proofs of Christianity, was that they were turning their belief system also into an apologetic proposal. In other words, trying to convert other people to that, that point of view of a kind of an absolute atheism with no question marks. But I think where I diverge from, not so much what you're saying, but just from my own background, I guess I'll just keep it personal, is that um, you, know, you go from a, a set of kind of evangelical fundamentalist pre presuppositions to a kind of a place where you hold mystery, you know, you kind of hide behind words like mystery uh, because they sort of let you off the hook on one end, but it's not very satisfactory. And then, you know, you're moved to your position saying, well, there's still a lot to discover in the future. And I think, you know, I would put it slightly differently. And that is where some of my reading has really changed the way I view things. One bit book in particular that I've talked about quite a bit and written about, um, is Elizabeth Marshall Thomas's book, The Old Way, which is about the, the hunter-gatherer people in the Kalahari who were there for the last 80,000 years. They sort of had religion, but not really the way we do. So really they didn't in the sense that we mean it. It wasn't a salvific thing that without this, we feel right. lost. But what they did have is marriage, childcare, mm -hmm. concepts of fidelity, all the things that my dad said came from Christianity before there was even writing, let alone mm -hmm. a Bible that's 10 seconds old. You know, this idea yeah. that these are ancient faiths is so ridiculous when, you know, 5,000 years is not ancient anything. It's like 10 seconds ago. And I think my point of view is that the human species, just as our technology outruns our ability to use it, we're always saying, mm -hmm. what can we do? Not what should we do? You know, and now we're into right. AI and it's like nuclear weapons and it's going to have a downside and we already know it and we seem incapable of reining it in. You know, here we go again. I think yeah. it's the same with philosophy and religion in the sense that we keep making these statements about our path or where we are as if we're in a position to draw any conclusions at all. Right. 
but we haven't even started evolving yet. If the human race survives, you know, the human race won't be drawing conclusions that look logical to anybody for another 10 or 20,000 years. I know that sounds crazy, but I really mean no, it because I, that's going to that's going to be the totally. cycle. We've been yeah. doing this for about 80,000 years. We need another 80,000 before we can talk about words like morality and even figure out what they mean because let's just take one thing, you know, Christian morality worked in a way sort of for a while because it mirrored what evolution already taught us it also destroyed our planet because we decided that we were you know it was here for our benefit and we we abused it so when i look at daniel dennett or i look at myself or i look at our conversation today i keep my yes but is yes but we haven't even started on our mm -hmm. own evolutionary path yet we're we're not sure. even fully humanoid yet and we're already you know making these Thing. So I don't know what you think about that. Let me reintroduce you. You're listening to and or watching in conversation with Frank Schaefer. I am Frank Schaefer. My guest is Becca McNeil. And Becca is a journalist and she's a very good one and writes beautifully and interviewed me. And then we had a wonderful conversation, which is a tricky way to get a longer interview. But there you go. So I returned the favor and now I'm interviewing her. So Becca, how do you respond to my, my little rant there? I love it. The... um the and i think about that often i also think that i mean each phase of evolution is born from the last one we don't mm -hmm. we don't leap the best we know right <laughs> um the the seeds of the next and my one of the questions i've asked since leaving evangelicalism is is my evolution toward finding better explanations Hmm. for th phenomenon that I for for an old way of thinking like is it should I replace my explanation for a seizure with from a demon to epilepsy and, and a medical condition in hmm. that case yes I do think so <laughs> um but looking at the whole world and like your dad should I explain morality should I go from a completely revelatory god-given explanation for marriage or morality to a completely materialistic like it's it's to our best advantage it's this chemical it's this mm -hmm. this you know that's evolved to make sure the ensure the survival of the children etc or is the evolution more in the questions that we're asking <laughs> and this sounds like a cop out, but I really don't think it is because I do think that I spent 10 years going, I need better explanations. Mm. I need better explanations for all these old things that like, why, why not cheat on my husband? I need an explanation. Mm. Not, I mean, I don't need a reason. I love my husband. I don't want to cheat on him, but I, why not? Mm. Why do I have a moral repulsion to that as well as like an emotional and which came first? And I think that turning from the i need a different set of explanations for the way things are i think asking questions about the way things are is mm. is an equally valid look at where we're at at the the path that we're going to roll the ball like do we know where it's going to roll no is there a place in the future where you know our incredibly evolved species has survived itself, you know, has made it past 2050, mm -hmm. has somehow adapted to the world that it destroyed and is, is just having a very different view because mm -hmm. of materialistic changes, because of different food sources, because of different climate, because of different societal structures. Absolutely. It's plausible. Mm. Is there some scenario I have can't imagine more likely at the same time could we be reaching a point where we are less interested in what we what our five senses are bringing to us and more invested in some kind of meta you know what I mean? There's, I think there's other possibilities too. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a, it's actually fairly 
you know, that people run those prognostications all the time. Like, mm-hmm. okay, based on how we, what we know about how humanity became, here's what our future looks like. And if you listen to historians deep, like who go way far back there, it's like, yeah, there's a lot we don't know about what mm-hmm. people believed. Right. We don't know why they, the, we see these things. We see the funeral structures. We see what appear to be religious structures. We see what appear to be like, we can interpret these cave paintings the best we can. At the end of the day, no one wrote it down to explain it. Mm. No one. They, and so there's, and when I say mystery, I don't mean we shrug our shoulders and say, we don't know. I just think that that leaves the door open for saying that the future and the past Mm-hmm. could hold way more radical changes in the way we relate to what is beyond what we see. You know, I want to run something by you, kind of test you as my little test market here. <laughs> and if Ernie, my producer, likes this, then he can just say, okay, I'll use this segment as one of Frank's things that I do, you know, something like it has to be said or something. But I'm thinking of doing a video sometime, you know, I post these commentaries, not so much a book, um, but just a comment that I, I'll make to you here and see what you think. And that is that I think that if you look at something like the sexual revolution in the 1970s, a lot of the academics who were pushing on the front of accepting a kind of a a looser morality than perhaps they had been raised with, thought that they were combating an over-fundamentalist, rule-based view of sexuality, of marriage, fidelity, and so forth, put in place by kind of a Christian morality they were abandoning and Mm -hmm. fighting against, for very good reason at many times in terms of some very stupid ideas. But, um, But actually, they were in a way the reverse image, the mirror image of somebody like my father's apologetic saying, without God, you won't have morality. Mm-hmm. Or your thing of, you know, why aren't I going to be unfaithful to my husband? You know, one of the things I enjoyed so much about Elizabeth Marshall Thomas's book, The Old Way, was that she actually did have access, as it were, to the those cave paintings, in that her mm-hmm. parents in the 1950s found and lived with this group of hunter-gatherers in the Kalahari that had never been Mm -hmm. approached by anybody else from the outside ever in an 80,000 year history. And so in a way, you know, this was an actual living time capsule, which then very soon disintegrated because of the apartheid Mm -hmm. South African regime come in and basically stealing stuff and enslaving these people. So it was a window of opportunity never to be repeated. Yeah. with with one of the oldest continuous groups. And what she found there is that they had a form of marriage. They also allowed divorce, but most of the, the bonded couples believed in fidelity. The whole village collaborated in raising the children. Mm-hmm. Females had exactly the same position in the in the group as males. They didn't do the same work, but they had the same power. That everything that supposedly a moral Christian and or good humanistic based society would produce because of its enlightened philosophy, they had fallen into simply as a group of hunter gatherers who had been in the same place surviving for 80,000 years. And certain things became very self evident to me reading that book. And that is a lot of the things that are that people think are the result of religion are actually religion codifying stuff that worked anyway before anybody thought of it being a religious principle. Yeah, or stuff that was advantageous to them. I mean, I'm still cynical enough to say (laughs) there's some society can be society because somebody had stronger weapons than somebody else and said, all right, you all work for me now. I mean- There's exploitation. And so, sure. Yeah, there were gods created to support, to baptize that. I what think we were going to do anyway. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And what makes me, what keeps me on top? Absolutely. At the same time, when you look at the things that keep cropping up in mm-hmm. unconnected places, right? Whether it's motifs in mythology that show up in groups that either go way, way, way back to, 
to prehistory that no one's even guessed at yet right or you know either that or there was a bunch of people traveling around that we just don't know Mm -hmm. (laughs) sharing the stories we see these myths that that share motifs that share ideas we see social institutions that start to look pretty similar we see a a bio we see biology yeah kind of evolving along similar trajectories with with people Mm -hmm. and i think that's for me this evidence of the 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 closeness of an intertwining if you will of connectedness Mm -hmm. and i i would say that i mean if you want to think of god as connectedness (laughs) connectedness <laughs> you know the fact that things are connected but the if you want i think that that to me speaks to inherent connection between spiritual curiosity and awareness and thought and and our nature and the fact Let me that there's something else at you before before you riff more on this it just seems to me you know we're we, we're told by people in the media although ernie my producer says no we are the media <laughs> no such thing anymore so yeah ernie we are the media but other media that we're in a post-truth environment yeah okay that's a nice turn of phrase but i have an answer for that bullshit because <laughs> because reality can't be negotiated with as right. our as our rising ocean levels you know carbon mm-hmm. emissions heat mm-hmm. waves floods prove don't mm-hmm. fuck with mother nature mm-hmm. they're so post-truth bullshit post-truth yeah. is a is an illusion yeah for people who want to cling to something for other emotional reasons like Donald Trump never lost an election or whatever. Yeah. We're not post-truth. He lost. And the fact of the matter is, if in claiming he won, he destroys our democracy, that's actually proof he lost. Because sure. in order to cling to his fiction, he has to take down our whole constitutional legal system, which yeah. proves he lost. So I, I think the same thing when it comes to relationships. We can call ourselves anything we want. We can have any terminology we want to describe relationships, we can talk about sexual revolutions. Well, how's it all working out? Right. So, you know, young people today are having less sex than young people did before the quote unquote sexual revolution. How did yeah. that all finish up? You know, maybe there were some feminists in the 1970s that made a big mistake in, in signing on to the male agenda that was being put forward by Hugh Hefner that now mm-hmm. we're all liberated and sex is just whatever, you know, there is no yeah. purpose really in the idea of either cohabiting or having children or family. These were bondages from a previous age. Well, you know, now it turns out this is what rich white people do and everybody else can go figure, but the people who are in the elites are still taking advantage of what we would call traditional morality and, mm-hmm. and their kids and everybody are doing better. So. The idea that you're in a post-truth era is nonsense. You're never in a post-truth era because to really be post-truth, you'd have to be post-reality. Yeah. As in, I can walk through brick walls without hurting my head. Well, you won't. You'll be in the hospital because you're never post-truth. You can just pretend you're post-reality. And I just want your reaction to that because I think we're in a time when the right and the left are pretending we're in post-reality. In other words... um, and I think we've done a lot of that. I mean, you can't have it both ways. Either everything is a mental illness and therefore it's not anybody's fault, no matter what they do, whether it's, it's you know, health problems, weight, obese, smoking, whatever, it's a disease or nothing is. But the fact of the matter is the real, the facts don't change. If you smoke a pack a day, you will right. have heart disease and lung cancer. You know, this is not, not this is non-negotiable. Right. I don't know. What do you think about that? And I've I've gotten pretty hard headed about that when it comes to the fictions of the left and the right. Mm-hmm. And I hear you. I'm kind of sick of the whole thing. Yeah. I. I mean, I think that for a long time we're not pushing. We are. We are. In an era of very limited consensus on 
on much. Yeah. And I think for a long time, we believed that what we called consensus was truth. Yeah. But what's dangerous about that is that consensus is subject to power. So the Mm -hmm. person with the most power gets to drive the consensus. And I think you saw that in evangelicalism in the biggest way, even to what you were saying of like people who won't leave because it would separate them from their re- the resources, mm. um, whether it's money, power, influence, whatever. And so I think that where you, what you run into is people wanting to, oh, there's so much there. So there's, there's the fiction of like, there is no truth. There's only power. There's no, like, we're in this era where the facts don't matter and people are going to do what they want to do. So then all that really matters is your ability to make what you want to happen, happen. And that mm-hmm. is a terrifying world, I think. I think then you are getting into a world where I can create a God who, as I believe that Trumpism has done, I can mm-hmm. create a God who blesses my plan. And I do think that is just a, it's a, it's so destructive and it's, it it is as the the collateral damage is huge. We'll put it that way. Now, when it comes to like the sexual revolution, because I feel this way about feminism where, so on the one hand, it was saying, you know, we get, we just got women on board with consequenceless sex which Mm -hmm. serves men pretty well because now you don't have any woman like, you know, at the same time, you know, there is, and, and just kind of what you said, okay, I'm trying to organize my thoughts on the fly. Um, your questions are, are, are not the usual bag that people come with, um, (laughs) to your credit. Um, so I have the same frustration with feminism that says freedom is found through work. Because I think that there's a perfectly already wealthy, already fat and happy group of capitalists that are like, great, you want to find, you want to find freedom through 70 hour work weeks? Go girl. You know, and you have to ask who's this benefiting Mm -hmm. now where this connects to the whole idea of like, is it mental health cause and effect? where we get hung up. And this is one of those things where I think really throwing off the evangelical shackles is hard is I still want to assign a moral value to something. Is it my fault? So you look at like the restorative justice movement. People are like, what? So he just gets to say that because his mom beat him as a child, it's, he shouldn't be punished. Are you trying to fix society or are you trying to, dole out moral whatever because the fact of the matter is that yes if you smoke a pack a day you're going to get lung cancer that's cause and effect and that's reality could your depression addiction etc be driving that yes so is it more helpful to treat it like that to save your life or is it more helpful to say stop it you're Mm -hmm. killing yourself and now you deserve to die because you're an idiot as the the hard far parts of religion often do. And so I think that what we really are talking about is, do I need moral and uh, moral frameworks in order to have human thriving? Hmm. And I ask this about raising kids because I think that so much harm is done when we are raised from our earliest days with all of our behaviors being assigned a moral value as good or bad, when really it is developmental. Mm. And when you start talking about developmental appropriateness and stuff, hardcore Dobsonite, um, you know, the old evangelical guard, I just hate it Mm -hmm. because it, you're saying like, I shouldn't discipline them when they're sinning they're like kids are sinning and they need and you start to like move away from words like obedience Hmm. but i think that actually aligns more to the reality but it also takes us further away from consensus because kids are all so different 
Hmm. And it's so much easier to look at the moral behavior of talking back to your parents, call it rebellion, end of the day, it can't Hmm. happen. Mm Mm-hmm. Instead of going, oh, your brain has passed into questing mode and you are creating neural neural pathways in a way that you haven't Mm. since you were a toddler. So of course you're doing this. Mm. Of course there's a function for this. Now you have some other influences in here and I want to make sure that this doesn't create danger for you. And we are in this era where that is creating discomfort at huge levels Mm for people whose idea of justice and health and wholeness includes punishment for wrong. But you know what? There's a flip side to that because I come out of the 1950s and 60s evangelical fundamentalist background where everything is seen in moral terms. Right. And if you were lucky and had loving parents like I did, it did not become oppressive or brutal because they were better than their theology. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But of course, we flipped it to the other side where everything has become medicalized now and it's a function of something else, you know, and and basically also combined with weird conspiracy theory, rampant, you know, wave goodbye to any facticity about anything. This is what I believe. And right. so, you know, and it has validity because I believe it. No, it doesn't. Um, right. let's, let's see how it plays out over a lifetime. Yes. And, and how this all works. Um. Because that's the test. It isn't yeah. like right now, does that sound cool and do you look good? It's it's yeah. how does this idea you have work? Carbon mm-hmm. fuels. How did this all work out? Not very oh. well. Right. Okay. And there, nuclear, you know, nuclear weapons. Yeah. How's this all going to work out? Not very well. So in the end, the truth will be known about everything. Yeah. It's not and like I, these are mysteries we can't unfold in terms of weight loss, what smoking yeah. does, drug addiction. What happens to a culture when you legalize weed and then Mm -hmm. it just so happens that the science of growing makes it 30 times more uh, (laughs) powerful than it was when the boomers grew up who pushed to have it legalized because they remember their fun little smoking something at Woodstock. It's a totally different drug today and there are going to be other consequences and you're beginning to see them in, you know, tent cities springing up in the so-called homeless population that turns out to be often 50% an addicted population of various things. Mm -hmm. These are no jokes. They have actual things. So, you know, you decriminalize shoplifting and all of a sudden there's 60 people trashing an entire Nordstrom's and now the whole downtown area changes because they're closing. The left has got to deal with the reality of certain decisions we've made. Oh, yeah. Uh, Institutionalizing mental patients, you know, across the board. In the end, everybody will know the truth. But the, de- the the capacity for denial from the left and right, from the religious and the irreligious, I think is just so massive that that the only thing that's changed, in my view, and I want your thought on this, is that because of the internet and because of social mm-hmm. media, the capacity for the falsehoods to have bigger followings than they could have mm-hmm. ever had in previous generations, conspiracy theories about vaccines, for instance. Oh, yeah. That's the new wrinkle. Thank you, tech bros, for yeah. opening the floodgates for every idiot with an opinion. This isn't <laughs> democracy. This is insanity. Oh, yeah, because, it's chaos. And, it, and we will pay for it because in the end, the truth will out. And it won't out because of somebody like you or me spreading mm-hmm. the truth. It will out because, excuse me, there is such a thing called reality. And when you flout it, eventually your downtown areas are trashed and it's a tent city and or you can't drink the water anymore or there is no more water because somebody pretended that you could just take all the groundwater you want and never run out. All right. So maybe our generation pays for it or somebody else. And I, I just... You know, my sense is whatever little time I have left as a 71 year old, whether it's with my grandchildren or my children or my family or myself, keep reminding you there is a there, there. Mm -hmm. And whatever Becca's ideas or Frank's ideas are this afternoon, ideas, shm ideas, in the end, reality will out. And I think we're living in the age where on a lot of scores, We're seeing the final destination of the sexual revolution. We're seeing how it all played out. We're seeing how workism plays out. Workism. How's that working for you? Yep. How's it worked out for you? Yeah. 
And, and I think that's the age we live in now. And I think as commentators or writers or thinkers or whatever, our job is to keep pointing to the fact that facts exist. Yes. Uh, Whether and, our take on it is right or not. Right. And I think um, there's many who say we've we've fucked around and we're in our find out era. Yeah. Um, and I, I agree. Exactly. I completely agree. I think that it, for, for most of us, just because of the way um, authority and truth and all of that was so tightly controlled for so long. Hmm. There is this, like, I think we're going through all the revolutions, the sexual revolution, you know, civil rights, all of this civil rights is different, but is this kind of like snap of, I can't like of the control and all of that being so oppressive. Like you had mm. good parents who were better than their theology. I to a degree did as well. Mm. Um, not everybody did. And no. the fact is that the Many damage, people did not tons of damage was still done. And I do think that the, the earth has felt the damage, mm. you know, people of color have felt the damage. Women as a collection have had felt, felt the, damage. the damage children people with disabilities. Yeah. I mean, all the marginalized groups that, hmm. you know, are trying to have an uneasy lack of a coalition really on the left. It's a, there's a collective, I think just snap of this is not tenable anymore. Mm -hmm. We are on the early side, I think, of the find out era, if you want to call it that, of the reckoning of the the harvest, the, all of the things, you know, you plant the seed, the seed will grow reality. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a difference though, between denying cause and effect and between that, or, you know, but let's just say there's a difference between acknowledging cause and effect. I can mm -hmm. say, if I hit you, you will have pain. If I lay out in the sun all day, I will definitely be sunburned. I will increase my likelihood of getting skin cancer. You know, all of these things, these are, there's cause and effect. If you ease up on, or if you just allow fentanyl to flood the streets, you will have massive death and homelessness. Yeah. Um. All of, and, but there's a, we're like children saying the opposite of saying drugs are bad and sinful and da 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 is right. everybody getting to take drugs and and i think that the solution is where like the there's a there are solutions oriented people mm. who can look at this and say the Two, true, two things are true. I don't want people to die. Hmm. I also don't think that throwing them all in jail and calling them bad people and writing them out of society hmm. is, is the most helpful thing to do. I do not want people murdering people. I don't know if capital punishment mm -hmm. is the thing that prevents that from happening. Mm -hmm. And so I think that when you take a solutions oriented, you have to, and honest, like this, the, I'm part of the solutions journalism network, Like there's journalists who are saying, mm -hmm. okay, let's look for solutions. Always in a solution story, we're required to put in evidence that it, like it has to align to reality. Right. Right. Limitations. There is no panacea. Panaceas, silver bullets are not connected to reality. Those are connected to power and profit. So what's the limitation of this solution? And so you have to put those things in, I believe, as a way of trying to walk this or like move us forward in this era of the old ways, the fuck around ways. Mm -hmm. are not working <laughs> and are and are doing harm mm -hmm. well we didn't really know we don't know how to not harm each other in a, those of us who've like the multiple generations every living generation that's grown up in capitalism 
doesn't know how to stop hurting each other. And you'll mm. hear people be like, I'm just like, what do I want to starve? It's either starve or exploit my neighbor. Mm -hmm. And so you have a looking back at the, at, at things we were doing that were harmful and we're hurting and we're reaping these horrible consequences that could obliterate our species, mm -hmm. but who are also saying, I don't want to use those old tools, mm. the tools that I know ended in harm and just think that if I aim them better, or if I use them to do something else, it'll be better. So a great example is like, um, like socialism and, and communism. Hmm. There are Americans who think that communism is what is going to help us. Well, if you look at communism, the, the only way we know how to use it and you go, Oh, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. And, and okay, that's, I'm out of my depth there because. No, it's a good example. It didn't turn out very well either. It didn't. We don't, we haven't. And the fact is that if you go back to human civilization, we haven't figured out how to do civilization but you know, I want to without oppression. In. I want to jump in with something. And, really, and I know we're going a little long here and Ernie, uh, I understand us. How, my producer, <laughs> um, but you know, this is what happens when you talk to Becca because she was supposed to interview me for 20 minutes and we talked for two hours. So I, I'm just giving you a warning. This will run a little long, but I want to throw something out at you, Becca, that I think that where the right and left have truly failed the American public, mm -hmm. be more specific, both the Republicans and the Democrats have really failed the American public. And then especially the right and left in terms of the, the, you know, the thinkers, the universities, the writers, and so forth. There's a bottom, bottom, bottom line to all human society, culture, and history. There is a mm -hmm. bottom, bottom, bottom line. Mm -hmm. And here's the bottom line. The human species needs to live in community. Right. It takes a village. Yes. What threatens community more than anything else? Disorder. Mm -hmm. That's what fucks everything up. Whether yep. you're a parent or single or, uh, you know, Elon Musk and my nine-year-old granddaughter, Nora, have something in common. Okay, he's mm -hmm. got billions and she's in fourth grade just starting and I'll pick her up after this podcast and I've got her snack ready for her, which today mm -hmm. is focaccia I baked for her because I'm a focaccia freak and she loves it. But they so, have something in common. Neither Nora or Elon can function in a climate of total disorder. Right. So you see the fury, for instance, of pay of passengers directed at the airlines and then at the Congress for not regulating the airlines after they for the third time their flight was canceled and they're sitting there with their trying to sleep on their luggage in in you know Boston or yep. Gatwick or London. All right, that's a small example. But I, ju I, I just want to get to this disorder and where the fictions on the right and left mirror each other, whether it's mm -hmm. the election was stolen from Donald Trump or that there will be no consequences if you if you trivialize shoplifting to the point where now it's a mass activity for 60 people at a time trashing an entire store. Mm -hmm. The next wave of American leadership, just speaking for a country I know something about and have participated in the politics, is going to come from either the right or the left or the center who can come up with a way for staying within the guidelines of our American tradition of democracy even if it's just sentiment sometimes, mm -hmm. and at the same time, dial back the disorder. Mm -hmm. And to expect humans, and I'm sorry, you know, hold the emails and the texts and everything else, and please don't cancel me, but to expect humans to absorb the amount of disorder we have injected into our culture at the same time. What mm -hmm. iPhones are doing to teenagers, mm. 50,000 suicides a year. Yeah not just amongst teenagers, but everybody. Perpetual and escalating gun violence because the NRA and Republicans won't dial back the disorder they've launched. Yeah. So you can look at the left and say, you know what? If one more person tells me that I got their pronoun wrong and that somehow I'm a bad person because I didn't read the latest directive on how to be mm -hmm. 
even more progressive than I thought I was. Or if one more Republican tells me about, you know, the right to bear arms is why they've got six AR-15s mm -hmm. and hundreds of thousands of rounds of ammunition, I'm going to scream. And yeah. not because of the reason they think I'm screaming, because I'm not transphobic and I own a weapon. I'm not any gun yeah. because I've got eight acres of stuff that I'm trying to grow things on. And sometimes woodchucks have to be dealt with. Sorry, everybody. Sorry, woodchuck lobby. <laughs> But the fact of the matter is what nobody on the right or left admits, whether it's AOC on the left making her pronouncements or Donald Trump on the right, and they're not morally equivalent. I like AOC, I don't like <laughs> Donald Trump. But yeah. here's where they both miss the point. We are overloading our republic with disorder. And if it's not real disorder and it's imagined disorder, in the head that's imagining it, that's still real. Sure. If you think the federal government's after you and stealing elections, that's still real. Mm -hmm. Where are we arriving at a toxic level in our culture? And what worries me most is not that democracy will fail because of the of Republicans and not that the left stupidity on so many fronts is going to kill us, but the sum total of the sense of disorder is going to open the door to, to an instinct to grasp order. And that in the end, the reason why some some an, a power like China or even Saudi Arabia is a threat to our way of life here, or Vladimir Putin, or anything else, or the right wing in Europe is a threat, is not because of the politics. It's because our ability to process a certain level of change and disorder is already at its limit. Mm -hmm. And this is where the left is really fucking stupid because they keep asking us to go yet another mile yeah. with their disorder. Yeah. And that's where nobody's right or left. We are just humans. And at a yeah. certain point, our brains can't process this shit anymore. Stop. Yeah. What do you think about my little sermon there? Ooh, um, I, what I think is this. In, throughout human history, our solution to disorder mm. has always, I immediately think of the Chinese warring states period where there's warring states who are constantly attacking each other. And the solution was a unified state under the rule of the strongest. We have constantly negotiated throughout human history, exchanging disorder for someone having power and control. I think both the right and the left want to use that model to try to restore order, either a government that in, that's why we have so much rightsism, I think, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is that I want to go to the highest court in the land, the ones with the most power, and I want them to enforce my rights and my sense of order, and everybody will have to adjust. And what's wrong is that we have it's it, it both sides are saying here's the new order here's and i and i want the power to enforce it no one has yet in civilization figured out ex <laughs> figured out how to create order out of connection mm -hmm. out of what what keeps me from stealing i love my sorry to sound like jesus i love my neighbor what keeps me from, um, no one has, no one has figured out how to both provide for everyone's needs and keep at bay the person who wants to come in and take advantage of our generosity. Because mm -hmm. you hear that argument a lot. Well, if we start just, if we let immigrants in, they're going to just take and take and take our things that we've built. We have not figured out how to, and I don't, I do not ascribe to that argument. However, you hear this, this anxiety mm -hmm. about who is going to both protect us from people who will take advantage, but also give us the freedom to mm -hmm. do what we want. And and so I think that where both the right and the left 
falsely believe well i would say that the left is more apt to think that the that the order establisher needs to be the coercive arm of the government government mm -hmm. is a coercive power and that's why when you have pacifists and stuff they're like nee, government enforced pacifism kind of an oxymoron mm -hmm. it's it's coercive all it can do is tell you here's what you have to do here's the punishment for not doing it and here's what i'm going to do with like mm -hmm. the pack taxes that i told you you had to pay um government i could you know government scholars and whatnot withhold your emails i'm being very right. general but and then the right wants to say oh no the markets the markets will establish order mm. they move toward order it's bullshit because now they're in this cycle of disrupting their own markets mm. that's so constant it's why your iphone is always obsolete and your streaming services keep going haywire mm. so we're i think that though what they want, what an Elon Musk wants is to be the one who establishes order because he, it's like a social Darwinism of like, I made it to the top, therefore I should get to determine. Mm -hmm. What the left wants is a government that is supposedly democratic and derived by all just the ordinary man out in the, you know, and has nothing to do with money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so there's this, I think you're right in that both the right and the left are laboring under the delusion that the power they want to see establish order is the better power. Hmm. Now, I have an opinion about which of those two I would choose. However, I don't think either one of them solves the, solves the issue hmm. of how do we have unity and diversity? order and connection how do we allow free i think that is the fundamental question at the heart of religion at the heart of society of government is can you have safety without coercion and control mm -hmm. and i and i i I don't know. I've only been on this earth for 39 years and yeah. somehow in millennia, we haven't seemed to have figured it out. Well, I've, I've done 71 and I wouldn't be in any further ahead than you are on that. But, and the only thing I would say to the left, because I am of the left, I am more of a progressive Democrat than I am a Republican by far. Mm -hmm. And I'm totally done with the Republican Party because it's not a party anymore. It's a personality oh, yeah. cult. So that doesn't even enter in. But let's say there were two actual political parties, mm -hmm. a Republican Party run by my old friend Jack Kemp, who's now passed away, who was a congressman and ran with Bob Dole as his mm -hmm. vice presidential candidate, who was a, a, a good, solid, conservative, compassionate man, um, not a racist and a very decent human being. You know, if he was the Republicans today, what I would say to both is, if you want to succeed, if you want your programs to succeed, it is in your interest, both Republicans and Democrats, left and right, to lower what I would call the volume of perceived disorder. I didn't say real disorder because perception is reality when it comes to disorder. If you feel mm -hmm. threatened, when I'm walking my dog and somebody speeds through my little neighborhood, even though it's 10 miles an hour and their sign saying slow for children, Mm -hmm. If I see a Jeep speed through some idiot on the way to wherever, my reaction is instantly to the right of Attila the Hun. And that is if I had a sniper scope, I'd take the son of a bitch out. And the reason yeah. why is because up that road somewhere is my granddaughter mm -hmm. waiting for a ride to school. And it's personal now. And I don't yeah. give a shit about law and order. And I don't give a shit about democracy. If that motherfucker is mm -hmm. threatening my granddaughter with that stupid Jeep that he wants to go at 40 miles an hour through a 10 mile an hour zone. This isn't about law and order or democracy anymore. This is a direct threat to my perception of order in my neighborhood. Sure. And that's the way we all really function when all the bullshit is gone. Both mm -hmm. AOC and Jared Kushner feel the same way when it comes to that sort of immediate visceral sense of a loss of order. Right. So my message to the right and left and to the Republicans and the Democrats is you better get in touch with the fact 
that if you allow the volume of your disorder, the volume of AR-15s as gun rights, the volume of tent cities and downtowns becoming unlivable, and even if that's not true, the perception of it in the Daily Mail is true. Do you understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Sure, sure. You will lose. Yeah. And, and, I think and that, that I just think that there's two different things. There's the reality of disorder, and then there's a perception of disorder. And the left, who I want to see win, because the Republicans must never win another election in my lifetime because they are the party of disorder, mm -hmm. and gun death and all the rest. If the Democrats want to win, they have to find a way to shut up their disorderly fringe and just say, fuck off for a while so we can win a few elections, because the perception of disorder is going to is the one thing that can destroy us. Yeah. And I think the challenge, the challenge I would hope to see is that. Find a way to do that without repeating. The. Um, oppressive oppressive way that we have behaved in the past when everything felt orderly you know um part of it i really i agree that it there's a lot that comes with it but i think that the instinct to say i'm sorry I'm just going to have to, you're going to, you and the population that you're concerned about is collateral damage. And this is where, and this is where I'm still too, like, I struggle with the idealism of, I mean, I struggle in that I take on oftentimes the idealism of the left because I go, if, can we maybe increase our capacity for perceived disorder or our, change our perception of it somehow mm. and take an approach that is addressing it and and fixing policies and taking a more utilitarian pragmatic approach to keeping people safe while not taking the people that we now see as danger and simply excluding them mm. from society or the community and i think that is the but again that gets back to the big question of we have never done it and well, i have it two, is... i have two points that i want to drill down on here one is that ernie sent me a text to my producer which <laughs> saying, is excellent, wrap it saying, up. before you end what oh. responsibility does the media have in being arbiters of objective mm. truth rather than merely recorders of current popular consensus. We're going to end on that in a minute. But before we say that, I just want to make sure people don't misunderstand me. I'm not just talking about the disorder that comes from people who claim a new pro down a week and tell the rest of us that we're miserable, uh, you know, oppress oppressors if we don't jump to the program. I'm talking about much bigger strokes than that. For instance, my grandson who on the beach the other day said to me, after we had spent the whole day there in a sort of quiet, dreamy voice, he's 13 now, you know, I like this a lot better than sitting alone in my room with my cell phone. Yeah. Okay. To me, disorder is a son of a bitch tech bro that doesn't mm -hmm. give a shit about my grandson and will sell him anything, yep. do anything to him. And these YouTube motherfuckers that Google owns yep. and runs who don't give a shit about his mental health. Yeah. I but I see and even all though, these people and to me they are a threat to my sense of order because I want him to grow up experiencing joy not the next thing some stupid algorithm shoves down his throat in his bedroom and that's where I'm reaching my limit of like democratic values free speech and the rest I want to lock the tech bros up and throw away the key they have fucked with my family well, here's the and thing. I'm not the only American who feels that way. And I, it's got nothing to do. And then if you say to me, do you really mean that? Maybe I do. And I'm just going <laughs> to, you know, move to China where they know how to handle people like this. Oh, you know? well, and I don't really mean that. But I, if I'm not crazy and, and fucked up in my brain because of the sense of disorder creeping into my life through these fucking telephones. Yes. Now that my grandchildren, I'm typical. That we agree there. I'm the parent of a seven and a nine year old, and every day 
I just want to scream into the void about YouTube and all of it. 100%. On the political scale, (laughs) I think that they, those guys posture left to feel cool. But if you see the right, not as the party of fuddy-duddy evangelical Mm -hmm. Um, don't make me use pronouns. If you see the right as that, then yeah, those guys are left. If you see the right as the party of unbridled capitalism and might makes right social Darwinism, right? Th- those are your tech bros. I don't That's think it. the tech, I think the tech bros are some of the least liberal people in the United States. This is profit driven. The reason ever, our children are ever, being suggested, not just the United States, least liberal ever. people ever. The reason our our children are being subjected to endless scroll, to algorithms targeting ads, to YouTube that sneaks in the back door of their learning apps and introduces, that's profit-driven. Yes. A profit-driven world will always be chaotic because it's endlessly competitive. Mm -hmm. And competition, to me, is the biggest sower of disorder known to man. Yeah. At the same time, I think that the left, the true left sees the definition of the true left is that they see government as the enforcer. And I think that can become just as oppressive and chaotic if you look at things like, you know, East Berlin. Um, And so I do think that there is a, there's this muddiness because of the intertwining and the masking and the hiding for so long that was happening on the right. And this, I'm going to use this to just segue into our last thing so that you can go get, uh, pick up your fourth grader and I'll go pick up mine. Yeah. Um, Cause I have, I have a nine-year-old fourth grade year old too, uh, waiting to, well, they should yet. meet sometime. We they should. Intergenerate your kid, my grandchild, you never yeah. know. Um, but The media's job is to disentangle that. Mm -hmm. The media's job is to know more about the conversation than what somebody said yesterday Mm -hmm. and to be able to connect what Donald Trump is saying to a history of thought and to a history of action and to a history of consequence. I think the media's main failing in all of this is that it went for a entertainment-based narrative instead of an information-based narrative. And, and we should have been scholars. We should, every media person writing the media should, should have to know their shit. Mm. And it's not like that because they're not, they're not paid well enough to do it. They're not that it is a grind. It is abusive. It's a, it's a pretty brutal environment, not sojourners. I will say sojourners practice is what they preach. Um, It's been lovely, but, I've worked in traditional outlets. I've worked in, you know, they're not named in my resume, but I've worked elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And there is an abdication of our responsibility to know what we are talking about. We're concerned with getting facts right, names spelled right, you know, pronouns correct, um, dates correct. All that's important, but we have no grasp on the fact that we are allowing family values or capitalism to masquerade as family values to masquerade as you know all this stuff we have not and tech bros to masquerade as liberal liberal liber- and actually what they are is selfish libertarian right. jerks who are in it for the money and don't want and are anti-government not because that philosophically they are but because they think they're smarter than everybody and they're too proud mm-hmm. to submit to any regulation at all Exactly. And so I think that um, where media and the deal is that, frankly, the sad thing is that when when we say media and we mean the actual journalist writing the story, hmm. um, that person can do very little on their own. And what you, about every, when you go to the next circle out and it's not even media, it's this army of nameless quote unquote influencers and exactly. if you think the journalists don't know shit you know yeah. you get out into the domain of lip gloss and 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 whatever the fuck 
Well, conspiracy theories. That's what you and didn't know. Conspiracy theories and anti vaxxers and yeah. people saying that, you know, it's caused autism or something. I mean, you know, then please just Katie bar the door, game over. And then just to yeah. d- just to finish here. So thank you. But look, um people who want to get in touch with you, Ernie will post how to do that everywhere. We put all this. <laughs> and by the way, when's that Sojourner's piece coming out where you interviewed me for it? They they kind of um chopped that one up and took out most of the in-person interviews I did and just made like almost a timeline type piece. Okay, good. And well, so fine. the the remainders of it, yours and several other interviews were we've got sitting and we're gonna figure out like a a part two. What to do with it. But in any case, irrespective of all that. We've got kids to pick up here, which is like reality bites. Remember I said we can have all the theorizing yeah. we want. And it's, it's like, yeah, we want to keep still. talking and everything. But now school's going to come out. First day of school back. Is this your first day of school back? Oh, no, we've been in a while. Texas starts at, you know, the in the demon's breath of summer. <laughs> okay, well, Massachusetts public schools start um, now. And this is the first day back. And then it's a short week. So I've got school pickups to do because... Uh, that's what I do in the afternoons. It's my best part of the day. Oh, that's so, um, so, so great. forth and so on. But but look, um, let me make sure I get all this right to finish up because I forgot we were doing a thing here. So I, this was actually all recorded and is going to go and has been going out live. So sorry, everybody. So I maybe forgot. don't put my contact information. <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> I forgot that this was a podcast. <laughs> Uh, in conversation with Frank Schaefer and my guest today is Becca McNeil and Becca just finish up one thing Um, just talk about their books people can get just the titles again Um, my book is bringing up kids when church lets you down have a copy right yeah hold that Um, up excellent um, you can get it wherever books are sold I recommend going straight to Erdman's and I have another book coming out next year that um, has a title but not much else to talk about yet. So that might be another discussion. Good. Well, you know what, day. let's, uh, Ernie, let's start, get Becca back to talk about whatever that is, because let's dig into her brain some more and see what we can find. It was fun doing that today. Thank you, Becca. Thank you, Frank. This has been so fun. I'm very sweaty, but I had a lot of fun. Well, you know what? <laughs> we'll We'll cool off now and go pick up our kids. Yes. <laughs> okay. Much love to you and yours. Thank you so much. Thank you, Frank. This is great. Okay. Bye. Bye.